what I'm talking about. joining us for the keynote on systemic design. We will uh, wait for another minute or so to um, wait until everyone has uh, entered. Seeing people coming in and joining. Hello everyone, good morning from Switzerland, Germany, and from Belgium. <laughs> and from India, I can read in the chat. Nice to have you here. Whoa, Australia. So good evening. Not only good morning, but also good evening. Romania and from New Zealand. Great to have you here. It takes a while until everyone um, has entered. So we wait for another 30 seconds or so until we start. Okay, so then let's start officially. Welcome everybody to our keynote on systemic design. Um, some organizational um, issue, this keynote will be recorded and also streamed on YouTube. Um, it will also be available after the keynote for review. Um, Feel free to post any questions in the F and A in, in Zoom here. And um, the keynote will take 30 to 40 minutes. And after that, um, we will collect questions in the, in the chat. Uh, that's important. Um, we will collect questions in the chat. Uh, because we plan on doing an uh, afternoon session, uh, a second session in smaller groups, where we then uh, discuss the uh, collected uh, questions from this morning. That makes it a bit more interactive to, uh, to work uh, with the questions. Uh, my name is Claudia. I work for a Swiss insurance company as an innovation manager and uh, design thinking coach. And uh, this is actually also where I met Crystal Funnell. Um, she coached us uh, in a systemic design project. And uh, I'm very happy to have, have her here with us for this keynote. Um, Crystal lives in Brussels and works um, as a creative director and partner at Naman. Uh, that's a human-centered design agency. Uh, she's also a teacher at uh, the University of Antwerpen. And um, she likes uh, comics, music, and films. Uh, I can assure you that uh, her keynote will be very hands-on, as the title um, already suggests. Uh, some of you might not have heard of systemic design yet. That doesn't matter. We hope that after this keynote, you will see where the potential of the methodology lies. And um, should we uh, have 
caught your attention with this keynote. As I said, there will be another uh, afternoon session on the topic that is not uh, actually on the website yet, but we will give you all the information at the very end of this keynote. So please stay tuned. For the moment, um, yeah, Crystal, let's start with the keynote, shall we? Okay, we'll start by sharing my screen. You can see it? Yes. Okay, so this will be about systemic design and especially about a systemic design toolkit that I've been creating. But first about us, this is Naman. We are a design company based in Brussels and we are about 24 people. Okay, systemic design. This is a definition on Wikipedia from the Systemic Design Association. It's an academic organization that organizes conferences about systemic design internationally. And basically they say, systemic design is a methodology to help uh, designers to cope with complex or wicked problems, such as globalization, migration, sustainability issues. And how can you recognize, recognize wicked problems? Well, typical characteristics of wicked problems is that there are a lot of aspects involved, like biology, psychology, technology, economic. There are a lot of parties involved, not only between an organization, but also cross-organization. And there are a lot of multiple perspectives and interests involved. So that's really typical for wicked problems. You can also recognize them if you read the newspapers, if you read them with a system design, with a systemic design lens, then you recognize immediately what are wicked problems. For example, people try to do something about a problem, but nothing changes. Or even things get worse. For example, the waste issues. Or another typical thing is that people try to hide the problem, which was happening with the migration problem in France. And even you could even have things like systems collapse. And uh, I looked it up this week. Basically, the, the, the Club of Rome in the 70s, they predicted that in the first decades of the 21st century, there would be a system collapse, including a pandemic. And how does it come? Well, one of the reasons uh, is really well said by Peter Sengen, one of the systems thinkers. We are not used to think, to look at issues as a whole. We are used to, we are taught at school to break the elephant into pieces and to look at each piece separately. And that leads to huge problems, that leads to huge consequences that are not intended. And an example of this, this is a very, very well-known story in the system thinking world, is the story of the cobras in India. There were too many cobras in India, and so the government decided to give a bonus, a price, for every dead cobra that people brought in. And in the short term, it worked very well. People brought cobras in, and there were less and less cobras. But then after like three or six months, suddenly there were much more cobras brought in. What happened? Of course, people start to breed cobras to get the bonus. Okay, said so the government, we will stop that. It was not a good idea. We will stop the program. And so what happened? People left, they freed the cobras, put them into, back into nature. And so at the end, there were more cobras as in the beginning. So that's typical an example of an unintended consequence. Another one we see today, there has been a lot of deforestation in the world, and the deforestation is one of the underlying causes of COVID-19, because there is less place for the animals, there makes that there are less animals, and the virus is looking for another host. So it's jumping from the animals to the humans. Okay, so this all means, all these things that we really need 
a new way of changing the system. And systemic design is a way to do this. So what is systemic design? Basically, it brings together two ways of thinking, design thinking that a lot of you know about, and then systems thinking that is less familiar in the role of designers. What is the difference between the two? Well, design thinking is typically, we are typically, as designers, we look at parts. We look at products, we look at services. But we are also very much people-centric, something that design thinkers are much less. We are also very much hands-on, very much into finding solutions, very much into iterating, creating prototypes. And that's another thing that design uh, systems thinkers are not doing. So we really focus on the dots, while systems thinking focuses on the whole. Systems thinking is a lot about the relationship between things, about different perspectives, different levels to look at, about creating a dialogue for collective learning, about working with leverage points in the systems, like acupuncture, so small places where you can achieve a big change. And also typical for systems thinking, it's that it's open-ended. You don't design a closed solution. You design an open intervention model that the system can adapt, adopt, and change. So in the drawing, you see that systems thinking is really focusing on the relationships between the parts. And so if you bring the two together in systemic design, you do both. You constantly zoom in into the parts and you zoom out to the relationships, to the whole system. Another important notion in systems thinking and systemic design is that there is an emergent behavior in the system that is not intended by one of the parts, but it is shaped by the relationships and the interactions between the parts. Okay, now I will tell you a bit more about the toolkit. So basically, it's a methodology, it's a collection of thoughts, frameworks from design thinkers and from systems thinkers. I created it first at Naman and then I started to collaborate with Chiften, which is a uh, systems thinking company in Belgium. And then later uh, I also collaborated with Mars, which is an innovation lab in Toronto and with the Systemic Design Association. Why do we need a systemic design toolkit? Well, systems thinking is quite difficult to understand and to grasp. So what I tried to do is to make a toolkit where the principles of system thinking are embedded in the tools, of course, together with design thinking methods. And it's very important to do that because if you want to change a system, you have to do this with the actors in the system because they will have to change the system. So you need something, artifacts, to create a dialogue with the actors in the system. I will give you an overview of the toolkit. So basically there are now more than 30 tools in the toolkits and I arranged them in seven big steps. So the first step is about framing the system. You want to understand what is the system about? Where does it begins? Where does it stops? Who are the stakeholders in the system? what is happening today in the system, in the regime, what is emerging as new initiatives that are trying to change the system in a different way. Then the second thing you will do is you go out and you go to listen to the actors in the system and you try to understand how they experience the system, what they see, what they feel, what their mindset is, what is the paradigm they have, what are the underlying metaphors, what are the dynamics that they feel in the system? With all those inputs, you come back and you try to understand what are all the factors that are influencing the, the behavior in the system and how they are all linked together. And for this, we usually create a causal loop system maps. You do this because in this map, in the system map, you want to understand which of the factors are more important than others. And those are the leverage points. 
you can work with. After that, before going to a solution, you go into a step that you think, what would be the ideal future? This comes from Virgil Akov, another uh, systems thinker from the previous century, who said, you have to do an idealized future and then you do backcasting. And why do you do that is because if you, people never disagree about what the ideal future would be. People disagree on the how, but in my project until now, people never that disagreed about the what. And by doing this, you open up their mind and you open the possibilities for real solutions. After that, in the next step, you will start to look at where can we intervene? What are the levels where we can intervene? And this could be something into structures, into the ways information is spread. It has to do with buffer capacities. It can have to do with loss. So there are different levels that you can use to like scope a bit, where can we intervene? And it's not about choosing one, it's about using the different levels together. Then next, you really go into designing the solution. You try to find an intervention model with activities that together can change the system. And very important here is that those activities are linked together so that they can reinforce each other. And then the latest step is really bringing your ID into the system. You start with a minimal viable version of your intervention model, but with all the interventions together, and then you scale it up into the system by, for example, creating learning networks, by uh, inviting media to spread the word, by inviting more and more actors into your ID. This is, this were the seven steps, and now I will give you some examples of tools. The first one is the rich context, and most of my tools are based on papers of systems thinkers. This one is based on a paper of a Professor Geelts from the Netherlands, where he um, describes how a systems change is coming, is coming in place. So he first explains that a system is under pressure because of landscape development. These are long-term trends and the system has to change because of that. But the change hardly comes from the regime, from the existing system. It mostly comes from new technologies or new emerging initiatives, it comes from bottom up and those initiatives grow and change the system. And so the tool I made is a tool to look at this so in the middle, you look like what are those trends that are putting pressure into the system? For example, in this time, it's Corona, it's climate change. How is the current system dealing with those trends? And how are emerging initiatives doing things differently? And these emerging initiatives are very, very important because if they are not there, there is the, probably the system is not ready for change. It's also very important to look at them because they can inspire you enormously for your intervention model. Because often they are doing the things right. They are just not connected and not doing enough activities. This is another uh, tool that we made. So on the moment that you create the intervention model, we saw that uh, our clients, they tend to focus on one activity and not connect the activities together. So we made a tool, we made a tool with connectors to force people to think about how our activities are working together towards the systemic change. And on top of that, we use paradox cards. We look what are the big paradoxes in the system and how can we use those paradoxes to reinforce our activities. For example, a typical paradox would be bottom-up and top-down initiatives. And instead of choosing if it would, should be bottom-up or top-down, we just look at both. How could we make our activity 100% bottom-up, 100% top-down, and how can those two reinforce each other and help each other to grow? It works incredibly well. And by the way, uh, these paradox cards will be available for free in a digital version in the coming weeks. 
Then a third tool, the third and last tool I want to show you is the intervention model. And this is based on a paper of Donella Meadows, also a systems thinker from the previous century. You should read the paper, it's really good. And she explains in our paper that there are different levels where you can intervene. And in our paper, she also explains that the more you, you are on the left, the easier it is, but the less influence it has on the system. And the more you go to the right, the more difficult it is, but the more impact you will have on the system. And from this, I made then an intervention strategy poster where people can then ideate like, okay, where can we intervene into the, into the system? This is about the toolkit. Now I will give you some examples of projects where we use the toolkit. The first one is embracing diversity. We had a Flemish client, semi government, who asked us to help to um, basically lower uh, discrimination and foster integration in Flanders. We worked with them over a period with 30 of 30 months and we worked with 100 actors in the system. So mostly civil society organizations. We started, there was a lot of tension in the beginning of the project uh, and a lot of um, mistrust between all the organizations. And so we started the whole session with basically the ideal future. So the one I showed you before, which is normally step five, but here we started with this and we asked people to draw a metaphor, to give a metaphor of how they perceive the system now and how they perceive the, would perceive the ideal system. And it was really nice because everybody came with a picture of the future, which was completely in the same way of thinking. And so immediately the tension in the group was, was gone and everybody started to trust each other. From all those metaphors, we then made one big metaphor with a tree with different fruits in it. And around the tree, you see the big trends that are putting pressure on the system. For example, migration, polarization, the third technical, third industrial revolution, the socio-economic device, and in the middle of the tree, this is really the picture where we want to go to. And this is another version of the same tree, but then we put the six most important leverage points on the tree. And this picture stayed with us the whole project, and people were always reminded by this. Like These are the leverage points that we should work on. In the first uh, workshop we did with about 100 participants, we took down the tree and we asked the participants to identify what the key initiatives, the emerging initiatives uh, are that already are working on those leverage points. And so we had a lot of harvests, a lot of projects were already working in those directions. So now it was a question to understand them better and to connect them. And that we did with another exercise. We looked at all the initiatives and we tried to understand what is the DNA, what makes that those initiatives work. And here you see one of our designers who is live drawing and what the DNA is that came up from all those initiatives. For example, sharing is one, uh, bottom up is one, inclusiveness is one, participation is one. Um, the sharing of storytelling is one. And so from with all those DNA, all the participants, they started to think about how can we then improve the activities we are doing or do new activities that go towards a better system change. This is another drawing of this DNA. And this was a second workshop we did with the participants to see how different organizations could start to collaborate together and could start to strengthen each other with their talents, with their capacities to, to even make their activities better. Another thing we did is we looked at, apart from the projects that we did, we looked at what was needed around those projects as boundary conditions, for example, at government, for example, at citizens level and how we could foster them 
And one of the things, for example, we talked about is that the language should be changed. For example, we shouldn't talk about integration because integration is a one-way word. We should find another word for that. And so we had discussions around that. This is an example of the connectors tool where we connected all the project, uh, all the activities together. And this is a workshop we, where we not only connected the activities put together, but we connected the projects together so that people could see how they could work together. This is another one where we are looking, here we are looking really at boundary conditions such as what are the paradigms that should be changed in society in order to, to get this diversity quicker. Another one, uh, this is another example of a workshop we did, and this was about business modeling. Because um, all those projects were subsidized. These were pilot projects that got money for three years, which is a bad habit because after three years, often those pilot projects stop, and because they don't have money anymore, do nothing happens with them. And here we were looking with the, the organizations, like how could they overcome this? How could they, for example, by collaborating with big existing organizations, let their project stay alive? And here we are using the, a, a tool which is called Transition by Design, where we are looking at how can we co go from the pilot project to a next stage and then bring it into the big system. So this is a first uh, project, which is a social project, but you can also use systemic design for organizational challenges. This was a project for EASMA, and EASMA is the innovation agency of the European Commission. And they came to us and they said, look, we have a big, big network in uh, Europe of all uh, people and organizations that are helping SMEs in Europe to innovate. But for the moment, we are very control-based and we would like to change this. We would like to be very more SME-centric. Can you help us with that? And initially they came to us and they said, we want a digital platform. But then we said, what do you want to do with digital platform? They said, we don't know yet. And so we proposed them, oh, maybe we should then should do some service design and some systemic design. And they, they agreed and that's what we started with. So basically, we started in a workshop by mapping the whole ecosystem. And this already showed that there were increasingly a lot of organizations within Europe, this is the middle circle, are around in the countries that are trying to help SMEs, but they are not connected enough. They are all doing initiatives on their own. So that was already one interesting finding. Another thing, Oh, yeah, that's the same. Uh, another thing we did is like, what do you want as an ideal system in the future? And so we designed with them, we came up with them with a, a kind of image from how would our system, how would our network be in the future? And so what they came up with is that it, it's, they would want it to be one door for the SMEs and one door leading, so every organization in the network would be one door leading to be able to connect to all the others in the system. And for, until then, the attitude in the network was a, a lot, this is my client. And this would, they wanted it to change into every client is everyone's client. And so really having a network that would learn from each other in order to help the SMEs in Europe. Here we are using the intervention model to see on what levels things should change. For example, there would be more, should be more uh, visibility of uh, the network to the SMEs, or uh, there should be a lot more coordination between the DGs in Europe. And then here we went into service design where we really designed the customer journey, the future customer journey of an SME with people within the network and how this would work. This is the deliverable that we did after this workshop. So these are all things that are very much co-created with the network themselves, 30, 40, 50 people in the workshop. 
to co-create how their own future service would be. And this is another exercise we did. We looked out, we looked how we could scale up and how especially the SME could scale up his journey into the system. So in the middle you have, he just started and then it's a growth into, into the possibilities of the network. And the last thing we did for those people is to look at the digital strategy, really the platform they came up, they came to us in the first place and we brought everything together and we uh, used a work domain analysis technique to analyze what this digital platform should be. Well, I did it in exactly 30 minutes, Claudia. You can find the seven of the most important tools online on the website systemicdesigntoolkit.org. And as I told you, the paradox cards will be available soon. Thank you very much, Crystal. That was really interesting. Also, when I read through the chat and um, on other channels as well, uh, people who are following us um, on YouTube, uh, it seems that this was really, really helpful for a lot of them. I guess you will get um, some um, emails um, asking you to um, facilitate um, and uh, and help people with the projects they are actually uh, in at the moment. Um, we have now 12 o'clock, so that leaves us with some time for this um, uh, keynote. I would like to use this time to uh, answer some of the questions that came in via um, the FNA and also via the chat. Uh, let's start with a question from uh, Lilian. Uh, she writes, uh, do you have an example for a system? Um, uh, is it at the level of a country, a challenge, e.g. poverty? And how um, it was it changed through systems design? Is that a question for me? Yeah. It can be. It can be on all levels. It can be on the level of a, even on the level of a family. It can be on the level of an organization. It can be on the level of a, a country. It can be on the level of the world. I don't feel confident yet to work on the level of the world. Like people are asking me now, can't you solve Corona? But maybe one day <laughs> it would be. It would be nice. But for example, Philippe, who I'm working with, Philippe van den Broek from Chiften, he's working on a project on world peace. So he's doing that. But he is doing this for 20, for 20 or 30 years already. <laughs> is that an answer? <laughs> well, um, I guess uh, it is actually. Um, it, it, um, that brings me also to uh, to another question concerning not saving the world, but saving um, doing something in the virtual or remote world. Um, is there an application of systemic design um, in times of of Corona, uh, not to solve uh, the problem with Corona, but um, our all problem um, uh, that we have to work remote? Well, what we are doing now is we, put, we are putting all the tools on the mirror board and we are working, we are doing systemic workshops with, uh, with clients that way. There is also a great tool that is called Kumu. This is really good to, if you want to create maps like actor maps or cross loop maps. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, by the way, all the information and all the um, the tools uh, you hear in this uh, in this keynote, they will all be uh, collected and put into our Flip channel. When you go through the chat, you will find the direct link. I posted it there. Uh, there is uh, another question from Sebastian Crystal, and he asks. Why do you um, use the ideal future 
um, rather late in the process. Yeah, um, isn't it easier for participants um, to start earlier with that? Can you um, give him an answer? It's a very good question because we do use it at the beginning a lot of times, but it depends a little bit on uh, what the issue is. It depends if in the beginning you know already where you want to go, because sometimes you have just an issue and you don't know what the ideal future would be. For example, we did a, a project with pregnant women in poverty and, in, uh, and in that were not going to medical care. And so in the beginning of the project, nobody exactly knew why those women were not going to the medical care. So we didn't know what the ideal future for them would be. So it depends on what you know in the beginning. If you know it already, like everybody wants a world without climate change, with good air, with cities where people can live, then you can do it, of course, in the beginning. Very good question. Mm -hmm. um, another one. Uh, do you believe that um, the notion of paradigms is easily understandable for participants um, or does it typically require a lot of explanation and demonstration beforehand? No, you couldn't just say it's the way of looking into, it's the way of looking into the system. It's the, the, the perspective you have on the system. It's, for example, if you see the mobility system, some people will say uh, cars are very necessary and other people will say uh, cars are really evil. So these are different ways of looking at the system. I think it's not that difficult to explain. What is more difficult to explain is the metaphors behind it. Mm -hmm. And that's something that is people don't, um, don't notice them. For example, at the moment, if we have the coronavirus, it's looked at as everybody's talking in war, war language. We are saying that it's the enemy uh, and we should uh, get the enemy out and we should fight against the enemy. And last week I was looking at uh, a, a video of a Dutch professor, Jean-Paul van Bendigem, and he said, it's a wrong, a wrong metaphor that we are using because we, would, we should look, the virus is not an enemy. It's not something else. It's here, it's in our bodies, in, it's in our environment. It's basically a guest and we should look at it as a host and we should try to understand the virus and not treat it as an enemy. Very interesting point. Um, I have, there's a lot of questions coming in. I'm trying to pick at least some of them. Um, one that I found uh, really interesting as well is um, if it comes to um, time, how long um, uh, do these projects normally uh, take? Um, that was the question. The question is, um, what if you have 10 hours or only 10 minutes? Um, can you still do something with uh, systemic design? Not in 10 minutes. Um, the problem is that you really need the actors and you really need to take time to interview them, to get them in workshops. You cannot do this without insights of the actors in the system. So that's the thing that takes most, most time. Once you have the insights, you can actually come up with already quite good intervention models within a couple of weeks, but then it takes time to implement them. It takes time to implement them in the system because you start very small as pilot projects in a safe place, and then you scale up little by little. And that can take like a year, two years, three years to get it really adopted by the big system. And um, another question that just came in, uh, do you have concrete examples of outputs with measurable impact after the workshops? So it's always uh, also the question of um, uh, on a workshop level, yes, and also on the project level, um, are there any KPIs? That's also a very good question, which is not very easy to answer because one of the the difficult things is that at the beginning, so within those first 12, 
to 24 months, it's look, it looks like not, nothing is changing. And then there is a tipping point when suddenly things are changing very rapidly. So for most of our projects, the change has not been massively yet. But you can see things uh, first things changing in this first period, like uh, people starting to collaborate together, organizations, or language that is changing. These are first indications. But we are working on this, is to try to find better ways to measure this. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, following follow up question, how do you convince your participants um, uh, about the value of systemic design or the people who are actually um, uh, also uh, giving the money and the time for that? Well, I never had to convince them until now because when they see the tools, they are like, ah, this is what we need. Finally, there is another way of thinking that could solve the problem. So up till now, I never had this issue, basically. But of course, the premise is that your, uh, your client acknowledged that the problem is complex, that it is a wicked problem, and that it's not just a problem, for example, of, uh, of a service that is not well done. And, al and also, I think you just have to convince people at the very beginning to do one workshop because as soon as they realize that they have um, a common purpose, then um, it's probably easier to take it from there, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah. 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 Okay, good. Um, looking through the questions, um, systemic design um, looks to be intended for policymakers, governments. Um, is there um, also an, um, a value to organizations? Yes, of course. You could also, you can already see it for EASMA, which is a bit more, of course, government. But you can also, for example, use systemic design for organizations to look, for example, how can we make our, our way of working more sustainable? Or how could we uh, change the whole mentality in our organizations to get to, for example, a more innovative way of working. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I mean also the way we use it, for example, um, uh, at, uh, at Mobiliar where I work, uh, we use it to um, create um, an ecosystem. And I think if it's talking about ecosystems and building ecosystems, uh, it really makes sense to uh, to use this approach. Yeah. Good. Uh, it's a quarter past. Um, I, I know there is still a lot of questions coming in. Um, I would like to uh, stop here for the, for the keynote, but I would ask you to actually now put further questions into the chat because what we're going to do and I will add all the information to the chat uh, in a second and um, what we would like to do is we will um, have another session about systemic design this afternoon at two o'clock. Uh, it is not on the website yet because we thought we wait until this keynote is over to also see whether there is an interest or not and um, to also have this uh, this interactive and spontaneous feeling bar camps normally have so um, there's going to be an another session this afternoon two o'clock where we want to take 10 topics or questions and discuss them Crystal and me, with hopefully a lot of you, um, in detail. So uh, what we would do is we would ask you to, um, uh, to put topics that you would discuss, would like to discuss further in the chat. We will cluster them and then we will also, um, we will discuss them in the afternoon in smaller groups. Um, 
that but that also means of course uh, there will be a, um, a limit to the to the number of participants um, in the zoom meeting in the afternoon uh, the limit will be 100 um, participants so but we will split up into a let's say 10, if necessary, 10, uh, 10 groups. We will work with Mural and discuss um, uh, all the topics. Uh, there will be information on that in the chat in a moment, but also uh, in, um, on Fleep in the channel um, and on the website as well, as I will activate the session um, right after this uh, keynote. So uh, please, I, will, I would love to give you now um, two or three minutes to actually think about the topic you want to discuss this afternoon in the session. Please enter these uh, topics. Um, yes, maybe with, um, with saying topics in front of it, like um, Letizia has just done. Um, Please post that into the chat because um, we'll copy the questions out of the, uh, the chat and organize everything for the afternoon. Um, yeah, as soon as we, we see that, um, that there's uh, enough uh, topics um, in. Crystal, do you want to add anything to that? No, it's okay for me. I'm, okay. I'm a bit distracted because I'm answering to the chat. <laughs> Good. Um, so we have topics like aging, uh, design, uh, dis uh, systemic design facilitation, um, um, designing healthcare systems to accommodate uh, different cultures. Okay. I think we will really have enough topics for this afternoon. So um, what I'll do now is um, I'll copy all the information um, to the chat. So this is the information and you already um, got the link in there to the session. Um, Please note the password is, as always or nearly always, <laughs> uh, Zurich, small capital letter, Zurich, small letters. Um, this link will also be posted um, on Fleep and on the website in the session in the next 15 minutes. Oh, okay. Didn't work with the uh, with the link. Give me another second. This is because I took it out of another document. My fault. Does it work now? Please let me know. No. Um, I'll have to check that again. Claudia, I think you have to select all panelists and attendees in the button. Oh, yes. Why did that change? Oh, yes, actually, yes, I did that. Hmm. Well, Give me a second. I will go into the session again and I copy it again from there. Takes a while. Getting there. Good, finally, sorry for that. 
Um, so again, it's going to be two o'clock um, for the session. Um, it's uh, called Systemic Design, 10 Questions, 10 Discussions. And uh, we are very much looking forward to see you there. Thank you for attending and um, have a good lunch. Bye, everyone. <laughs>